G'day folks and welcome to this playthrough of the South Pacific Scenario from Mark Herman's Empire of the Sun. This is the second edition, fourth printing, recently arrived. Uh, I've been working my way through this and um, I've been playing some of the full campaign. I thought I'd um, shift over to this South Pacific Scenario. So this is Scenario uh, 1710 from the, uh, the recent rule book. This is not in the earlier editions. Uh, it has been included now as part of the, the uh, yeah, rule book, um, which incorporates all known uh, errata. So, with this scenario, this is the, the setup for the scenario. We are focused on the, uh, the South Pacific around New Guinea, New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Northern Australia up here. Um, the scenario dictates setup and it tells us that the US player, the Allied player, draws Operation Watchtower as their future offensive card, while the Japanese player has the Japanese counterattack at Sava Island with two random cards and two random cards for the Allied player as well. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, whereas normally the Japanese would have the initiative, the Allied player can play their future offensive card to seize the initiative and, and go first. And yeah, in this scenario, that's what they're going to do. Um, you'll notice this scenario kind of abstracts some elements. So this is Oahu out here, abstracted by this hex with the Central Pacific HQ. Um, and it tells us conveniently that it is 25 hexes from New Caledonia, from Numia out here, and 23 hexes to here, 22 hexes to Espiritu Santo. So <clears throat> that will help us to activate our allied units um, at the start. Some other things to keep in mind is that there is inter-service rivalry for both the Japanese and the allied player. Uh, there's the US air unit in China box over there. Um, so what do we do? Well, the allied player goes first. So I'm just going to go with this future offensive to see what happens this is i guess the <laughs> the historical kind of option here we so we select the card being played we pick our future offensive to seize the initiative uh we what, what, what can we see on this card okay so it's a, a three op card um if we play it for when you have a card in your hand you play it either for offensives so using this number up here or for the event and you're using these details down here um I'm wrapping my head around the pros and cons. The advantage of offensive and playing, playing the card for the event is you seem to have, uh, you seem to have, it's a bigger scale offensive, uh, bigger operation. Um, you can activate more units. Um, you use the logistic value on the event instead of the, the value up here, um, which lets you activate more units. But I think the downfall is because it's a bigger planning, there is, and over a larger period of time, there is a greater opportunity for your opponent to um, react in strength. So you may find playing for the operations, for the offensives, maybe smaller uh, operations, but less chance of um, your opponent discerning the details on that. But because we're launching a large offensive here, Guadalcanal Invasion, that's exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm playing this card for the event. So, what that means is, there are a couple of... With an, when you play your card for the event, you can declare an unlimited number of battle hexes. Um, if you play the card for offensives, you can only declare one um, battle hex. There's also a difference in the number of units you can activate, as I said. So, if I were to play this for... Um, offensives I would add my headquarters efficiency rating the number in red for example shown here and this is printed on the map just to show you that's where it stays so I would add three to three for uh, six activated units as I'm playing it for the event I add the headquarters efficiency rating three to the logistics value so three plus five is eight what that means is that for operation watchtower I can activate eight units on the map now, this Empire of the Sun comes with a huge deck of cards. This is the well, this is a full Japanese deck of cards. You can see I don't know how many are actually in there, but it is 
a lot. Looking at maybe 86 plus. Um, this particular scenario uses a smaller deck of roughly, what am I looking at here, maybe 20, 24, 25 cards thereabouts. Um, so, and, and there are many historical events and, whoops, many historical events and uh, <laughs> reaction cards and different types of cards. There are, you can see military uh, operations, there are reaction cards, there are resource cards, political cards. Um, uh, the, what I'm raising here is in particular your, your, um, face down, your military operation offensive cards often have limitations on what you can do. They may restrict you to activating a certain type of unit, such as only air units, or in this case, a maximum of one ground unit may be activated for this offensive. So you've got to keep that in mind. Pay very careful attention to the conditions. It may dictate, uh, so midway, for example, that you can only declare battle hexes on one hex island locations, things like that. So there may be restrictions on what you can do by using the event as well, um, which you need to pay attention to. Okay, so the other thing to keep in mind or to look at here is the intelligence value of the attack. Now the default for these for offensive is um, surprise attack. And uh, this can possibly be changed by the, uh, the reaction player, the opposing, the non-active player, making a die roll to potentially change the condition or playing a reaction card to change the intelligence condition. Uh, and they can change that to, for example, this one shows intercept, uh, but it can also be ambush uh, as well. Okay, so with that done, with the card played and the sort of settings determined, the active player, the offensive player as they're called, selects the headquarters to activate. Now, the allied player has, I think, a number of headquarters on the map and around. Uh, there's one here, Southwest Pacific headquarters down here. There's the Central Pacific here. Uh, and here we have the South Pacific down here. Um, the difference is really there. There's two key things to look here, at here. First of all, their uh, efficiency rating, which I pointed out, this increases the number of units they can activate. So three plus five gives me eight. If I activate these, it'd be one plus five, which would only be six. And over here, it would be two plus five, which would be seven. So the first thing to keep in mind here is that by activating the Central Pacific headquarters, I am able to um, activate more units than these other headquarters. The second thing is range. So the first number on the headquarters is their range. Range of 25 means they can activate units kind of from Oahu down to here. Uh, these guys have a range of seven, so they could do much the same, and these guys could do much the same as well. The range of 20, they could, rank, they could reach all those, those units. The principal difference then for us, looking to wage an offensive up here, is that efficiency rating of three, giving me extra units uh, to activate for the offensive. So I will pick this headquarters to activate. Now you normally check their supply status, I won't go through that, but I can assure you they're in supply and there's no problem there. If they're out of supply, they subtract one from their efficiency rating. There are some other rules um, that you might consider later on as, as well regarding Japanese headquarters and, and things like that. Now we get to activate our units. And each unit has to be within the activation range of the headquarters, right? So 25, which means I can't activate any of these units around here. They're out of activating range. The units must be in supply, um, but they don't necessarily have to draw supply from the activating headquarters. As long as they're within range of A or N, uh, HQ, they'll be, they'll be fine. Um, A, now there's also activation restrictions as well in terms of what nationalities can be activated. So you notice this third New Zealand division, they're a Commonwealth division. Um, they can only be activated by Commonwealth HQ. So we're looking principally at US units. And this is gonna be principally a, a naval um, operation. So we'll be looking at our 
blue units. If, as I pointed out earlier, there is inter-service rivalry, then we can't, in fact, activate both blue and green. Okay, so I'm not allowed to, whilst this is in play, I'm not allowed to activate units of from the Navy and from, from the Army. I have to pick one or the other. So what units do I want to activate? Okay, well, they're kind of ruled out because that's a headquarters, that's a Commonwealth unit. Uh, I can only activate one ground unit for this. And here we have the strong hard hitting first marine division stacked with our fleets so i'm going to activate this ground unit put them aside that's one now i have seven more units to activate let's go with there's one two three four five six all right so that's six then we'll activate let's say well what else can we do not much um We'll activate these guys as well. They might be able to do a great deal. Um, and yeah, that'll be it. So we'll activate, we'll put them on the bottom. You guys can hang back in Numea. And we'll activate these six units uh, on top. Okay, units are activated. We can then begin uh, their movement. And the <laughs> the range for naval movement, the range of the, I'm going to put this against the side so you can see what we're looking at here. And this is a land ground unit and we have five uh, naval units. The damaged Lexington and Enterprise and Wasp and then the Northampton and the North Carolina. The maximum range they can move from their hex is equal to five times the operations value on the card. So five times three, they can move up to 15 hexes. So quite a big range. Um, what we're looking at here, a turn, is effectively three months of, of operations. So one card play in a turn, you might consider that it's basically roughly a month, perhaps three to six weeks of, of operations. We're not looking here at just a single battle or a single fleet engagement. We could be talking here about a whole one card play. It could be quite a large... Um, series of, of operations um, and that's one of the first things you really need to wrap your head around with empire of the sun you're not just looking at moving units in to attack to conduct a battle it's a broad these these movements are very broad scale uh, operations in an area that cover potentially several months uh, several weeks even several months okay so uh units i'm looking around here i'm sure the japanese have some air yeah here we are there on the ball. Um, so, something to keep in mind with movement is that um, enemy units project a two hex zone of influence around them. So, um, enemy air units. So, these enemy air units project this, this zone of influence into C zone, which may prohibit uh, movement and supplies, a couple of other things. Um, yeah, but I mean, what I'm trying to do here is seize Guayal Canal, which is outside that, that range. Um, what, when you're moving, when you're conducting offensive operations, you can move from friendly ports to friendly ports. I could reinforce cans over here. Um, I could move into a hex with enemy units. Um, but CVs, of course, attack at a range of two. So all I have to do with these CVs is get them into that two hex range and they can launch their aircraft towards Wider Canal. The other units that I have here, so I've got the, uh, the Northampton and the North Carolina, um, and the ground unit, of course. So the reason I keep stacking these together is because one of these ships will, uh, they'll be moving together, I think. Now, there are <laughs> options here. I could, um, I could, what could I do? I could divert some ships off to create additional battle hexes to tie down Japanese defenders. But just to keep things simple, I want to keep my fleets together. Now that may not be the most prudent strategic move, um, but this is certainly what I would consider a beginner move. It keeps things simple, keep my fleets together before I kind of understand the, the deeper intricacies of the game. So what I'm gonna do, 
is move my fleets to Guadalcanal. They're within 15 hexes, that's quite easy. You can follow a path, they get up there quite easily. Um, and my first marine um, division is going to use an amphibious shipping point, an ASP, to get there. Um, this is a, a prohibited, uh, sorry, this is a, uh, an amphibious assault. Um, certain units can't do this. The Dutch, the Chinese, and the Indians can't do amphibious assaults. Um, US Army ground units um, can't invade one hex islands like Guadalcanal by themselves. So let's say, I'm sure I saw some. No, maybe I didn't. So they have to be, um, yeah, with the Marines um, joining them. Um, most units that you move in this way, amphibious assault, they cost one amphibious shipping point. This will change throughout the course of the game. Okay, they also, I'm um, using that amphibious shipping point, they are also limited to that five times the ops value, so they move up to 15 hexes. Um, but, and they must begin in, in a port as they did. Um, they can't, they can't launch amphibious invasions of mountain regions with the sole exception of Port Moresby down here, uh, which the Japanese, of course, tried to do in 1942, prior to the Battle of the Coral Sea, which is around here. The Coral Sea, there you go, <laughs> print on the map. Um, I mentioned those zone of influence effects. So units cannot enter an unneutralized enemy zone of influence. So I could not have moved my amphibious unit to attack, for example, Bougainville. Um, but fortunately, Guadalcanal is out of that range. Um, there are various other effects as well. Um, the, yeah, um, like I said, just covering the very basics here. Uh, in addition to that, look, you can also engage in strategic movement. So, um, you know, I can move this air unit here up to Espiritu Santo. Um, the re so there's two numbers, there's two ranges based on this unit. It's a two on the far right, and then their extended range are above that. That extended range they can use for um, uh, strategic movement, but they, if, they, if they move at any point using that extended range, they can't join a battle. So although they're one, two, three, four hexes away, they can't join a battle using that extended range. Okay, so I'm hoping to sort of move them up uh, later on. Okay. At this point, having done all my, my movement, and again, not confident at all that it's a good thing to do, that I'm probably making suboptimal moves, the reaction play, the Japanese now, can have the option of playing a weather card. And this is the first time I've seen their cards. They don't have any weather cards. They do, however, have this um, reaction card. So the intelligence condition is, is, as set by this card, a surprise attack, but the reaction player can change that First, by playing a reaction card, if they don't want to do that, they can make an intelligence die roll to attempt to change this condition. In this case, the Japanese have Japanese counterattack at Savo Island, so they will automatically change the intelligence condition to intercept, which will give them an opportunity to respond. Um, it'll give them that basically this, this um, uh, reaction move. They can now activate a number of units equal to their headquarters efficiency rating plus their logistics value. So five, um, yeah, three logistics plus two is five. They can now activate five units to get in here and, and intercept. So with that, done they activate their headquarters and now pick five units in range of 12 of their south seas hq um okay and they've got some big ships we also sorry i should point out as well they cannot activate units in this hex does that mean the hq as well i'm not sure um even even so let's use a combined fleet it's even better um, they can use 3 plus 3 is 6, activate 6 units, they have inter-service rivalry, so they have to be white or yellow, so army or navy, they'll pick the navy. Um, you'll notice these guys are, have a range of 3, extended range of 5, so 
they can reach from right where they are. So that'll be activated. Um, and they don't need to move. These aircraft, they can fly to the battle hex and then return. We'll also activate, um, let's say, one, two, three, four, these Japanese fleets to come and intercept. And we'll bring um, one, two, three, four, five. I think we can bring this air unit across as well to Bougainville. And then go one, two to reach there. And that's quite a strong Japanese force now um, reacting into the area. Okay, so with the reaction forces determined, two air units and four fleet units, we now conduct combat. And there are two uh, stages of combat. First of all, there's air naval combat using all air and naval units. Then we have ground combat after that. So, we uh, first determine if combat is sequential or simultaneous. And this is, is based on the intelligence condition. If we have a surprise or ambush, either the attacker or the defender respectively will roll first. If the intelligence condition is intercept, then the battle is simultaneous and they basically both apply steps at the same time. That's the case, so that's what will happen. They'll both roll in effect simultaneously. The so they both in effect we'll do um, we'll do Americans first because they were the attack the offensive player here. They add up the attack factors of all air and naval units. So 16 plus 9, 25 plus 24 is 49. So they have 49 attack factors being brought to this combat. Um, again, carriers can attack from this two hex range. Air, if they could reach, could attack from up to their up to their range. Um, if there's no parenthesized value, as shown here, they can use their extended range. So 49 for the Americans. And again, this is effectively simultaneous, but I'll just do this sort of one at a time. We then need to um, consider and this is the air naval combat results table. You need to consider the die roll modifiers. It's not an ambush, it's not a surprise attack, it's not 943, it's not 944, and there are no event or battle card modifiers. So no modifiers for the American. They simply roll here, and a roll of zero is shocking. That gives them one quarter of their, um, their battle factors. If we look at 49, one quarter is just 13 factors. That's how much damage they've done to uh, the Japanese. 13 factors. The Japanese have uh, 10, oh, 10, 10, 18, 34, 34, 40, 50, 60 attack factors. They have no modifiers either. So 60, a roll of seven gives us a one. So they have a one times multiply to their 60. So the battle results in 60 Japanese damage to the Americans and 13 American damage to the Japanese. We now need, that's, that's pretty, much, pretty much how combat works. It's fairly straightforward. Um, once you're rolling the dice, it's just one die roll each. Um, we now need to implement that damage on opposing um, units. Air units and carrier units, not in the battle hex, um, can only receive hits if, and I'm reading here, if the rolling player has an air unit or carrier for each such air unit, which they don't. Um, I didn't roll, you can also, if you roll a 9, it's a critical hit. If you did not score a critical hit, I reduce my units. The receiving player applies hits to any full strength eligible units. So basically, among the 60 damage, we have to flip this over and flip this over. Um, 
Basically to resolve hits, you're looking at the defense strength of these units. So the strength, the strength the defense of eight, defense of 16 means 16 factors satisfied. Eight, so 24 factors satisfied um, of those 60 hits inflicted on the Japanese, we've now satisfied 24 hits. We have 36 left to resolve. Now, even though the Japanese have got 36 hits left to resolve, these units are ineligible and um, thus they won't take any more hits. Okay, so we've reduced both of these units and we don't have any full strength carrier units left. If there were full strength carriers, um, the hits would stop there because the Japanese can't reduce every full strength unit. As all the allied naval units are at reduced strength, we can continue applying hits. So from 24, we eliminate this for 32 total hits. And then from 32, we eliminate the North Carolina for 48. Now we still have 12 hits left to resolve, but there are no longer any um, naval units in the battle hex. The Americans have been wiped out in the hex. The carriers are quite scared and they won't engage any further. We still have 13 hits to resolve. And well, there's not much we can do here. The Americans will flip the Aoba and that's all they can do. So not a very good battle for the Americans, a good response from the Japanese. And again, maybe a better American player would have intercepted the Japanese at Rabaul and stopped those fleets from coming in to disrupt their plans. But that's not what I did here as a relatively new player. Okay, so the, <laughs> the reaction player won the air-naval battle and thus the amphibious assault may not proceed. They have to retreat and they're in a bit of trouble at this stage. So post battle movement now happens and this is where um, air or naval units can can yeah conduct an additional move. We don't leave the carriers out here by themselves so we might pull them back way back to here. We've lost our surface fleet cover from uh, a nice couple of these are casualties here in that battle. Japanese just suffered a slightly reduced um, naval unit. So yeah, they, they certainly won that combat uh, convincingly. With that done, we check for uh, overstacking. Um, so stacking is seven or more naval units, four or more air or ground um, units. Uh, if a hex is ever overstacked, you eliminate units for saying with the air units and yeah that's pretty much the end of operation watchtower and the japanese response from this point that was the american turn we'll head over to the japanese turn and they'll get an opportunity to launch their own offensive but hopefully that gives you the kind of bare basics as i understand them of how to conduct your first offensive card play in this South Pacific scenario. This, this particular opening doesn't really take into account um, aircraft zones of influence or supply um, or ground movement. Um, it just focuses your attention really on naval movement, um, amphibious shipping points, and air, uh, CVs, aircraft carriers, and their support for combat. Um, it's a nice introduction to Empire of the Sun uh, in contrast to the opening for the full campaign where you've got 26 units moving and a lot of ground movement going on. Um, yeah, so hopefully, folks, <laughs> that's, uh, hopefully I've made no mistakes. I'm still coming to grips with this. Far from optimal moves, but a good Japanese die roll in combat saw them do a heck of a lot of damage to um, that uh, allied attempt to invade Guadalcanal. Thanks for watching folks and take care.